Welcome to this Academy for Teachers Masterclass on Richard Wright's never before published novella, The Man Who Lived Underground with Maurice Wallace. I'm Carla Cherry, and I have been teaching English for the past 25 years, including 12 years at Innovation Diploma Plus High School. I love what I do because my work develops young people with strong reading and writing skills that inspire a love of literature and learning. I'm a proud fellow of the Academy for Teachers, an organization that offers educators meaningful professional development and allows us to meet other great teachers from diverse schools. We learn more about all sorts of topics from masters in their fields, and I've used what I've learned in my classroom for years afterward. I have the honor of introducing Maurice Wallace. Maurice is Associate Professor of English at Rutgers. His fields of expertise include African American literature and cultural studies, 19th century American literature, the history and representation of American slavery, and gender studies. I have been a fan of Richard Wright since I read Black Boy and Native Son as a teenager. The social justice issues like the ones that Wright tackles make my students want to read. I am extremely excited about taking this class. But Maurice is not the only star of this masterclass. It is also my honor to introduce the 16 teachers here today. This is an impressive group with advanced degrees in English, African American studies, education, ESL, US history, educational administration, and writing. They teach grades three through 12 and early college in public schools, charter schools, and independent schools. We teach some really interesting subjects like Jane Austen and the Brontes, Shakespeare, and podcast production. The number of extracurriculars we coach or advise blows my mind. Everything from sewing to skiing to contemporary music club and bowling. There's a lot of teaching experience here today. We've been in the classroom between one and 36 years. The total number of years we've been teaching is 291. We teach between 20 and 250 kids. The number of children who know our names is 1,665, and that's this year alone. So your real audience today, Maurice, are those 1,665 kids and the 1,600 students we'll have next year, and the next, and the next because every teacher here will, in some way, share with them what we learned from you. The ripple effect of a master class is huge. Thank you, Dr. Wallace, for being here. Thanks to my fellow teachers for teaching. And with that, let the master class begin. Maurice, take it away. You are muted, Professor Wallace. Thank you uh, so much, Carla, for um, that amazing introduction. And I have the sense that you too are amazing. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, I am grateful to Sam for extending the invitation uh, to join you tonight. And um, we will reconvene again early next week. Of course, um, Renee has been um, an administrative force here. And uh, I appreciate not only her, her, um, her helping me to prepare um, uh, for tonight's conversation, um, but also for her, her presence um, tonight. She's um, expressed as eager and interest in learning as I think any of us have um, about Richard Wright's The Man Who Lived Underground. And um, Rachel, I also want to acknowledge her. I hope that um, there won't be any technical glitches that uh, require her to reveal her superpowers, but, um, but it's reassuring that she is present anyway. Let me say that um, I am grateful and inspired 
by um, this occasion because while I make my living um, conducting research and writing to academic audiences largely, my heart is in teaching. Um, I love what I do. I love um, the students I get to engage and interact with so much so <laughs> that I have to resist at the end of class, especially a good class. I have to resist telling those students I love them. <laughs> I just don't know how they'll hear it. Um, but there is a real feeling I experience and it feels like love. Um, and when I've done my job well, and when they've responded well, that feeling overwhelms me. And I think I get uh, and identify with all of you in that respect. I've read your profiles and I can't tell you how inspiring those profiles are. Um, uh, Carla said that I wasn't the only star. In fact, I was prepared not to be a star at all um, and to leave all of you to bear that, to bear that title. Um, I hope that our conversation, if not tonight, then certainly uh, next week will bear on the creativity and sensitivity and deep feelings that we all share for teaching and for the well being and flourishing um, uh, of our students. I hope that will be evident um, in next week's conversation if it doesn't uh, sort of uh, manifest itself tonight. And it's quite possible that um, it will. I will own just one thing before I launch into. Um, the conversation about Richard Wright particularly. Um, and that is that the word master causes me to bristle a bit. Um, I don't think of myself nor my, um, my approach to what I teach, what I read, what I write, what I research as invested in mastery. This may be a master class, but it is a master class only in so far as um, collectively we um, arrive at a place of facility and deep insight on the work under our common study. So I hope that um, you do not mind if I imagine myself not as um, uh, a master teacher or a master lecturer, though I like to think of myself as um, having a pretty uh, good skill set in that regard, I rather um, find more gratifying the possibility of thinking with, um, studying with. And so even if I'm responsible for facilitating um, our engagement with Richard Wright, I hope that um, it will be evident by the end of our time together that you have taught me some things and I have taught you some things and we have taught one another some things because um, that's the kind of learning I enjoy. In fact, I am a teacher, not because I know much of anything, but because I wanna learn. And my students are sometimes my best teachers. Um, maybe you've had that experience. If you haven't, I hope you will. Um, but, but I said that to say analogously that I expect to learn as much as I expect to um, teach in this context. So again, thank you for having me. And um, I want to sort of segue now into um, thinking with you about Richard Wright's The Man Who Lived Underground. And I want to do so by um, first imagining 
um, that our engagement with the man who lived underground is something like an approach to the novel. Um, and if our engagement is an approach to the novel, I want to begin by asking us to consider what it means to approach the man who lived underground now. Why now? Why 2020 or 2021? Why this publication? Belated as it is, why is now a particularly instructive time for us to be reading this recovered work from, um, from Richard Wright? And um, though I will love to hear what some of your speculations might be, I want to posit that there is a certain timeliness about the publication of The Man Who Lived Underground Now in this post-George Floyd moment. Um, and not least, this timeliness has to do with Richard Wright's engagement here and at least in two other texts, The Outsiders and The Long Dream. Richard Wright takes up the very explicit subject or takes up the subject very explicitly of police brutality. It is of course, one of the most significant issues of our day, what it means to police in America, what it means to police black and brown bodies, such that we aren't talking about individual police officers, but we're actually also talking significantly about policing as a form of social control, as a form of um, maintaining what is in the interest of some, the status quo, the political and economic status quo. Um, so I'm interested tonight to suggest, to submit that approaching the man who lived underground now is significantly um, related to our shared, our common public investment in conversations about debates over social um, divisions appertaining to policing in American, uh, in contemporary America. It seems to me that the man who lived underground as it um, sort of unfolds around an occasion, an event, a tragedy of police brutality situates this novel in our time, in our moment, as squarely as anything that Richard Wright has written. And yet the irony of this is that there probably hasn't ever been a time in American history when the man who lived underground was not timely, was not relevant for exactly these reasons. It seems to me that early in this novel, we are compelled to notice the violent power of policing. We are compelled to, I think, consider the possibility that above ground exists as nothing so much as a police state for Black Americans 
historically speaking. That is from slavery through its aftermath, through its afterlife until even now. I am interested now in Richard Wright's reflection on American policing, policing racial communities, policing race, um, policing the movement of raced bodies. It seems to me that that policing happens um, most directly on American streets, but indirectly, it happens in the halls of Congress. Indirectly, it happens at city council meetings. Um, indirectly, it even happens in our classrooms. And perhaps we ought to be honest as teachers that there may be as much policing in American classrooms with similar killing effects as there is on the ground in our public, uh, on our public streets, in our public communities. Now, I don't say that to be provocative. I say it because I am reaching toward what I think is true, what I am learning as I read. And part of this learning, Richard Wright is in fact uh, responsible for, or at least um, helps to significantly influence. But what I want to underscore here um, about the coincidence, let's call it, of the timeliness of this novel is not really what happens to racialized bodies on the streets. As sensitive as I am to um, so much violence that is state sponsored, I am also now really um, interested in and sensitive to, thanks to Richard Wright, what all of this violence is doing to black and brown souls. Let me say that again as interested as I am, as sensitive as I am to what state violence does to racialized bodies, the man who lived underground, my reading of it now forces a new question. What is all of this violence? And what is all of this policing doing to the souls of those whose bodies suffer at the hands of state-sponsored violence. Again, I am far less interested in the motives of particular police officers or particular police departments as I am interested in the policing and structures of policing that perhaps lead inevitably to so much of uh, the outrage and the outrage against the violence that we have seen um, manifest itself in American cities. Fred Daniels is not only a man of his time, he is a man of our time as well. 
And this text, I think, helps us think about what so much violence is doing to Black souls. Now, let me put that aside for the moment. Perhaps we'll revisit it. I mean, at some point, we must. But let me put that aside in order to take up briefly another approach to the man who lived underground. And that other approach to the man who lived underground is to think about its own history. So if previously I have imagined approaching the man who lived underground now, in this moment, I want to imagine approaching the man who lived underground then. And by then, I want to talk about the period framed by 1940 and 1944. Now, it is in 1950 that um, Richard Wright's contemporary, Zora Neale Hurston, writes for Negro Digest, that essay that I think you have all um, gotten a chance to review, what white publishers won't print. But Hurston could just as easily have written that essay a decade earlier. Um, if she had, it would have spoken significantly to uh, that period between 1940 and 1941 when this novel finished around 1942, 1941, 1942, early 1942. Um, uh, however um, artistic, it's earliest critics understood it to be. I'm thinking of one Richard Wright expert right now, a Frenchman by the name of Michel Fabre, F-A-B-R-E, who managed to read the manuscript of the entirety of The Man Who Lived Underground um, as it was produced um, in its original draft. He celebrated this novel. He celebrated it for its artistic effect. He celebrated it for its um, allegorical power. It was, um, he thought, one of Richard Wright's best pieces. Now, this after having um, already published, Wright that is, having already published Native Son. Um, Native Son, of course, met with a great deal of fanfare, selected as, um, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, the very first um, novel by an African-American to be featured um, by the Book of the Month Club. Um, it was a runaway hit um, when it was published. Wright's agents and his readers expected something of a follow-up to Native Son and got instead something far less dramatic, um, far less urgent, it seems, and rather something more allegorical in the man that lived underground. You may or may not know then that this novel had tremendous difficulty, was rejected repeatedly by major publishers. Um, because it just did not strike publishers as um, reaching readers in the same way, the same visceral way, perhaps the same suspenseful um, uh, way that Native Son did. And so it wasn't until 1944 that uh, an editor of a short story collection um, someone who had known Richard Wright um, decided to include section three of the man who lived underground in his collection. Um, and that's when it was originally published. 
It was not published, therefore, as a novel. It was rather published as a short story, but a short story of such length that it was often referred to as a novella. For our purposes, then, I want to talk about the, no the man who lived underground as we've received it as a novel and its earlier incarnation as a novella. Now, why might so many publishers have resisted um, the man who lived underground in its novelistic form apart from um, the difference it struck from Native Son? Well, one of the reasons I've asked you to read uh, Zero Neil Hurston is because I think she offers some insight into um, the publisher's mind. That is to say that Zora Neale Hurston's uh, first sentence in that article is, I have been amazed by the Anglo-Saxons lack of curiosity about the inner lives and emotions of the Negro. And then later, um, she refers to the internal emotions and behaviors of minorities that seem just not on the radar for American publishers who themselves understand themselves to be representative of the American reading public. So that if white publishers don't imagine that there's a market for um, anything appertaining to the internal lives and emotions of the Negro, then um, it would seem that their presumption is that the American reading public, read white American reading public, has no taste or interest for the internal lives and emotions of African American subjects. What do you get from the man who lived other ground but an exploration of the internal life of, um, of our protagonist. In fact, one could say, allegorically speaking, that that's all we get if one takes the underground, not for a realist representation, but for a symbolic representation of um, the private mind of Wright's protagonist. So what white publishers won't publish has a great deal to do or had a great deal to do in 1950 as it did in 1940 with the audacity, let's say, the presumption of Richard Wright to allow a readership to enter into the mind of a Black American and find him thinking. Find him thinking independent thoughts. Find him thinking thoughts that defy stereotype. Now, we could go on and talk more about Hurston, um, about the particular, the other particular details that seem to um, be lost on, seem to have been lost on white publishers. Her concern is not just for um, the internal thought of the Negro, her concern is for the obsessiveness of white publishers with black Americans of the servant class. Those who could, if they might imagine, be easily, um, um, easily stereotyped those that white Americans presume to know already. She's also concerned about the absence of um, what she calls higher emotions and romance in um, African American, in, pu in publishers who publish African American writing. There is no interest or no taste for those things, it seems. Finally, um, as I said previously, 
the novel, the draft of the novel gets published as a um, novella and, um, and um, it is met with a good critical reception belatedly, which is to say it's mostly overlooked, underappreciated um, in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, it's only been uh, since the 1960s, 1970s, um, and 1980s, perhaps, that uh, the novella gets uh, recovered and is appreciated. Let me um, sort of read for you just a bit of what um, one critic has had to say about, um, about The Man Who Lived Underground in its short story or novella form. This is, uh, these are words by uh, Carla Capetti, um, whose article is entitled Black Orpheus, Richard Wright's The Man Who Lived Underground. And she says, the man who lived underground tells the story of an epic journey that classical and modern European and American writers have told numerous times. A fugitive escapes to the underground sewer of an unnamed city. In the footsteps of Orpheus and Odysseus, Virgil and Dante, Ishmael and Queequeg, uh, Huck and Jim, he begins to explore the underworld, the world of darkness, nature and death. It is a modern version of the fugitive slave narrative a literary form whose famous representative, Frederick Douglass, is honored through the initials of Fred Daniels, the novella's African-American protagonist, as he escapes from corrupt history and corrupting society into ostensibly free and liberating nature, Fred Daniels is suddenly transformed from privileged house servant to underground criminal discoverer and explorer. Now, one of the things I want to point out about this review of The Man Who Lived Underground is just how wide its, um, uh, its associated texts are, which is to say that um, Professor Capetti sees um, not only um, this text as somehow um, responsive to um, uh, Odysseus, but it's responsible, it's, it's responsive to Huck Finn. It's responsive to um, the enormous symbolism of uh, Moby Dick. Um, she could have also added, as we hear, if, uh, as we hear in the afterward, she could have added Plato. Um, she could have added the Gospels. She could have added, perhaps, um, even more obviously, Dostoevsky. She might have even referenced, though it followed Invisible Man, I'm sorry, it followed The Man Who Lived Underground by almost a decade, Ellison's Invisible Man. There's quite a lot about this novel that is reminiscent of Invisible Man, so much so, in fact, that um, I began to scratch my head wondering about the association. I know that Richard Wright and Ellison were friendly, um, but I did not know that, um, in fact, weren't just friendly. The truth is that Ellison was, um, was Wright's best man at his, at his wedding, um, at his first wedding. Um, so they were quite the comrades, of course, but I didn't appreciate in literary terms how close these texts are. Um, and and I wonder now about Ellison's reliance, in fact, on the man who lived underground in some fundamental ways. Well, um, uh, let me move on from that to um, simply uh, describe this novel now as consisting in three sections. 
Section one is a dramatic unfolding of, of action, which also alternates with um, the flow of Fred Daniels' own thoughts. So it's very early on that Wright risks defying the expectations of white publishers and takes us immediately or almost immediately into the mind of Fred Daniels. I'll forgo um, reading passages for now, um, but um, it's, it, it happens on the first page. Um, and the unfolding of action is, um, is almost immediate um, and sudden and abrupt, perhaps as sudden and abrupt as the accusation um, that is leveled at him. The abruptness of the beginning repeats the abruptness of the charge, okay? There's section two of this, um, of this novel where he is more formally charged and terrorized, frankly, um, and then compelled to uh, return to the scene of the crime in section three or just before section three begins, Fred Daniels slips underground. I'm interested in these three sections because they also repeat the organization of Native Son. Only the three sections of the man who lived underground do not have names associated or titles associated with them as Native Son's fear, flight, and fate do. But one has the sense that, um, that Wright could have easily um, given these sections uh, titles. I don't know, and I haven't thought or paused long enough to imagine what those titles might be, but it seems to me that one of them, and we'll return to this, one of them must necessarily be guilt. I want to talk about guilt in just a moment, but I want to switch gears in the time um, that remains toward this third approach to the man who lived underground. Um, and I want to call this approach uh, uh, a perspectival approach, which is to say that I can imagine two or three critical perspectives that we might adopt and approach the man who lived underground with and yet very fine and gratifying readings from, interpretations from. Let's start, for example, with a focus on psychology. On pages 103 and 104, um, in the middle of page 103, for example, Wright writes, he was filled with reflection, experiencing again the high pitch of consciousness, gazing like an invisible man hovering in the space above the life that lived above ground in the darkness of the sun. Now, never mind this allusion to invisible man, but this phrase high pitch of consciousness. And again, on page 104, we find a similar, uh, we find similar language, feeling a desire to sleep more than any ambition to explore further the strange reaches of consciousness, which had gained such a mysterious hold upon him. He sighed and picked up the box and jar and waited again in the sliding gray water. It's this language of uh, consciousness, desire and consciousness, sleep, desire and consciousness, which brings to mind um, nothing so much, and there are any number of other uh, rele uh, related um, phrases and turns of phrases um, that bear on uh, Richard Wright's investments in the psychological. Now, Richard Wright was himself a student of psychoanalysis, um, had read widely in Freudian psychoanalysis, though he rejected Freud wholesale, or to put it differently, did not consider himself an acolyte of Freud. Uh, he was selective about what he thought uh, was valuable in Freud. In any case, he was so deeply invested in psychoanalysis that 
during his time living in New York, in Harlem in particular, he lent both um, um, sort of rhetorical and financial support to the founding of a clinic of psychoanalysis in Harlem. Um, the psychoanalyst himself was named Wortham, W-E-R-T-H-A-M. His first name escapes me, I apologize. But, but he had strong ties with Richard Wright and Richard Wright believed in um, uh, psychoanalytic therapy and wanted to do so in Harlem in particular, um, perhaps um, because he had come into some um, uh, contact with the early ideas maybe of a figure like Franz Fanon, who around 1950, 1951, 1952 would produce that psychoanalysis of race called black skin, white masks, okay? Um, but perhaps he, um, anticipated um, Fanon. In fact, Fanon quotes Richard Wright, I'm now remembering, in, um, in um, Black Skin, White Masks. So there's a relationship there. And uh, Richard Wright's interest in psychology and psychoanalysis is deep. So there is a psychological approach. But if there is, if our approach to, uh, to the man who lived underground can be said to be psychological, generally speaking, we might have to be even more particular because it seems to me that um, it is the psychology of black religion, particularly that Richard Wright seems invested in, seems curious about, seems to want to explore what it means to live or to inhabit the black Protestant life world of his grandmother. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to uh, read that, uh, that essay, which is also included in um, this edition of The Man Who Lived Underground, Memories of My Grandfather, I, my grandmother rather, I recommend it to you. It is the most, um, reliable, uh, I think, uh, criticism of the man who lived underground. This is to say that Richard Wright illuminates, as well as anybody I have read, his own work. He not only gives us uh, a sense of its motivation, a sense of its inspiration, and in fact, that word is used on the first page of this essay. But he goes so far as to provide us his own interpretation of his own work, which is not a reductive interpretation. It isn't that he offers up his interpretation as the only available interpretation, but one such interpretation. Um, and for the remainder of my time, which I think is about 15 minutes or so, I want to, I, I want to, uh, I want to have you uh, follow me um, in that essay in particular, um, because I think some of what's written there will call to mind um, really powerful scenes from uh, the man who lived underground, and um, in in the last few minutes of our time today, we will get the opportunity, I hope, to visit um, uh, one or more of those passages. But I want to hear. I would love for you to hear what Richard Wright has to say about what he has written, um, because I think going back, um, his words provide or shine a light on some of the dimmer aspects of. Uh, of this novel. Um, and I have to say that The Man Who Lived Underground, the novella, is, was far dimmer reading experience than the novel because the novel fills in gap, the gaps of um, uh, sections one and section two. They represent gaps that are filled, 
um, for those who only had the opportunity to read section three when it was published as a short story slash novella. I want to call your attention to um, that essay of his then, um, which appears on page 163. I have never written anything in my life that stemmed more from sheer inspiration or executed any piece of writing in a deeper feeling of imaginative freedom or expressed myself in a way that flowed more naturally from my own personal background, reading experience and feelings than the man who lived underground. And if you'll skip a sentence, um, he goes on to say, in all of my other attempts at writing, I felt that I was reacting in terms of many partial, limited and incomplete concepts. But here in this book, there is only one, expressed in many terms and seen from many points of view, but still one, far-reaching, complex, ruling idea feeling hovering in the background, like the rhythmic beat of the bass in a jazz song, fusing and lending unity and meaning to the images and symbols and movements within the story. And then he goes on to say um, in the next paragraph that, that one idea, that one concept is to try to understand what he refers to as the ardent and volatile religious disposition of my grandmother. Now, if you uh, read Black Boy, you will remember that his uh, grandmother was a fervent Seventh-day Adventist. Um, and someone who um, Richard Wright never quite understood or someone whose fervency he never quite understood. And my sense is that his interest in his grandmother's religious disposition isn't just about his grandmother. It is about what I refer to as the Protestant life world of Black Americans, this religiosity of Black Americans that um, is deeply felt, so deeply felt um, that um, the image of its sounds and traditions doesn't soon leave him. It shows up early in Fred Daniels' experience in the underground. In fact, one could say that the underground is um, significantly constituted by these um, Black religious feelings, these Black religious rituals, these, these, these Black religious sounds, this Black religious language that was so much a part of his grandmother's life and experience. Now, one of the things that connects Black religion and psychology, and I think is the spine, the thematic spine of this work is the subject, perhaps the psychology, perhaps also then the theology of guilt, guilt. If there is one thing I want to talk about, to teach and learn as we discuss this novel, it is guilt. It is um, his, Fred Daniels rather, um, ambivalence, his, not altogether clear understanding of, but unavoidable confrontation with guilt. In this novel, there is, um, guilt is conveyed as a criminal idea, but I think it is also conveyed as a religious idea. So much so that 
those two ideas go together, crime and religion. I wonder if under Richard Wright's hand, guilt as a concept is not only the thing that religion purports to rescue its subscribers from, but is also in some ways the author of. Let me see if I can repeat that in, um, in other terms. Does religion, and this is a question, not in any way an expression of um, um, personal disbelief of any sort. It is an intellectual or philosophical question. Does religion rescue its adherents from guilt or does religion in fact generate the guilt from which it purports to rescue its adherents? In other words, before we think of guilt as a criminological idea in the man who lived underground, maybe the roots of it lie in something quasi-religious slash ideological slash philosophical. I think this novel is about guilt. Um, and um, again, because I, I, I recognize that um, time is limited, I'm, I'm only going to refer to just a couple of passages, but there are many that I could um, call your attention to. I am struck reading um, this novel by the regular refrain, I ain't done nothing, but I ain't done nothing. Sir, I haven't done anything. Page 12, I ain't done nothing, he said, looking from face to face. Page 14, mister, I tell you, I ain't done nothing, he cried, his mouth twisted, tears streaming down his black, wet cheeks. In the middle of page 15, they made him feel somehow guilty. Page 16, at the top, mister, I ain't done nothing to nobody. Hours later, in the temporality of the novel, he was condemned, lost, inescapably guilty of some nameless deed. This page 36. I s -s -s swear b -b 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 before God, I, I, I ain't d -d -d done nothing. Again, page 36. This guilt is not only written, it seems everywhere felt. And I think there's something to be said for his reaction upon entering the sewer to the hearing or the overhearing of the religious ceremony going on above ground. He enters into the basement and overhears a religious ceremony taking place. Um, and if I can locate that passage, I'll read some portion of it quickly. Um, page 61 is where that passage appears. 
um, using the pole as a makeshift ladder, he slid down along until his feet touched the ground and he stood apprehensively in darkness. The air smelled fresh and he could still hear faint sounds. He poked about cautiously his hands before him, his ears still catching sounds, his fingertips searching space for solid surfaces. Suddenly he felt a brick wall. He followed it and the strange sounds which he had ignored for a little while became louder. Again, he stopped and strained his ears. What was that? The vast overhanging silence made what little sound that did trickle through seem odd beyond description, yet those strange sounds were somehow very familiar to him. That was it, strange but familiar. And we could go on and read the, 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 um, the remainder of that scene, but before long on page 63, right, writes this, he felt that these people should stand silent. No, I'm, I'm a little bit too far uh, ahead of myself. If I go a little bit further to the top of the page 63, he says, don't do this to yourselves. His emotions subsided and he came to himself. What was he saying? A sense of the life he had left above ground crushed him with a sense of guilt. Would not God strike him dead for having such thoughts? As he lay upon the bed of pipes, he knew this. His life had somehow snapped in two. But how? When he had sung and prayed with his brothers and sisters in church, he had always felt what they felt. But here in the underground, distantly sundered from them, he saw a defenseless nakedness in their lives that made him disown them. A physical distance had come between them and had conferred upon him a terrifying knowledge. He felt that these people should stand silent, unrepentant, with simple manly pride and yield no quarter in whimpering. He wanted them to assume a heroic attitude, even though he himself had run away from his tormentors, even though he had begged his accusers to believe in his innocence. And this is where I want uh, to pause and suggest that there is a kinship, a relationship between his own feeling of guilt, his own insistence upon his innocence, and uh, the religiosity of those he observes and is suddenly separated from, um, whom he now sees differently from below. It is, I think, a certain feeling that they, as he has, have internalized guilt and that their religious expression is their own managing of a deep-seated guilt that is difficult, impossible, perhaps, to get rid of. What I want to submit um, is that in no small measure, the novel is Richard Wright working through what guilt does to the soul, to the mind, and perhaps even more part particularly what the experience of Blackness is when Blackness itself is a form of condemnation. What does it mean to be born condemned and to have that condemnation worn on one's body, worn on one's very own flesh. I think I will stop here. I've been talking for a while um, and you've been patient. And I just want to put those terms on the table for our consideration. Um, and maybe 
Um, I know there's only about five minutes left. What I'd like to do is to ask you for any quick responses that you might have. Salima, I see your hand. Um, and then um, I want to offer you some further questions, more particularly framed questions for thinking as we prepare to meet again and have discussion next week. So a couple of discussion questions I want to offer. Salima, what say ye this evening? <laughs> Hey, um, Mr. Wallace, I want to say that you remind me of a Southern Baptist preacher. I feel like that's the <laughs> vibe I'm getting from you. But one thing that really stuck out to me when you were talking about Wright and Ellison and how they were close, where like, was somebody like sampling someone's work or anything like that? I had that like same initial feeling, but I was like, no, I think they're just bearing witness or confirming how the time actually mm. was it was like because I felt that same thing like like hey this sounds a lot like but um no. yeah I I didn't know they were that close but I knew they were in they had to be in the same circle you know there's not too many yes. black writers in that time so they had to be in the same circle yes and yes so um let me confirm my own southern black baptist heritage all right, um, so you've got good ears. Um, but I also wonder if those two things need not be mutually exclusive. I don't mean to suggest that Ellison um, stole anything from um, Richard Wright, but I wonder if it is purely coincidence that um, Ellison's underground and Richard Wright's underground struck them both as um, effective symbols for getting at the um, um, private thoughts or the internal thoughts and emotions of Black life. It may well have. It may be purely coincidental that both of them found this metaphor useful. Um, and they may have arrived at that independently. They may have arrived at that in conversation. Um, um, and they aren't the only two, obviously, who have found that image, the cave, um, the underground. They aren't the only two to find that trope significant um, and instructive. So thank you for that. But I agree with you. They both bear witness to a certain kind of modern reality for the likes of Fred Daniels. A uh, Fred Daniels, by the way, um, if I'm going to be critical, who, eh, I'll, I'll forgo that for right now. Anybody else? Um, There's something in the chat. Uh, who's that from? From Rachel? Um, oh, no, it's from from Mary oh, Grace. Mary Grace. From Mary, Mary Grace. Grace. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, Langston Hughes Salvation. Uh, I love that short story. Um, yeah, I just looked it up. It's 1940 also. Oh, interesting. Interesting. That that's a really good companion piece. I hadn't thought about it till now, but thank you, Mary Grace. That's a really good companion piece um, for, for this. Um, I, I see the name Irene Redfield. So someone has mentioned uh, is bringing to bear um, passing and maybe quicksand also, Nella Larson, um, for our consideration. Maybe this is one of the things we should keep in mind for next week. So what are the companion pieces that might help us um, make a case for, um, for the man who lived underground and especially for our students? Like I'm really interested, I mean, I'm interested in um, the man who lived underground for my own selfish, professional, intellectual reasons, but I am equally interested in what we do with this in your classrooms, in our classrooms. Um, I wonder how guilt plays to high school students, how religious expression and guilt plays to high school students. Um, I'm really, really um, interested to have us consider that. Let me also mention a couple more things that I think we can talk about next week. And then I'll close my mouth 
and um, 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 and then we'll either close or I'll simply listen to anything further that you have to say. You might remember that I also asked you to listen to that short selection, um, that short audio clip from NPR about um, New York's underground. And it's only 10 minutes, but I called from that 10 minutes four phrases that I find particularly provocative um, that I want you to note and perhaps they'll come up again in our conversation next week. The first phrase is different dangers in the underground or the different dangers of the underground. That's one, different dangers of the underground. The second one is sometimes time just moves differently underground, which is rather a sentence, right? Sometimes time just moves differently underground. Um, the third phrase sounds like the subtitle to an article I might write. Um, legality, mortality, and morality. Legality, mortality, and morality in Richard Wright's The Man Who Lived Underground. Maybe one day I'll write that, I'll write that article, but not before I come up with a really sexy main title. That's my favorite thing about being an academic, coming up with clever titles. Um, and I sometimes I start with a title before I even have an argument. Um, I probably shouldn't tell you that, but I love titles like that. Um, and then the fourth one is New York's subconscious. New York's subconscious. Now, beyond these phrases, we might also consider exploring gender in the man who lived underground. And that's as much as I'm gonna say about that. Um, because I fear to say more is to, be, is to sort of prescribe where I wanna go and I don't wanna prescribe anything. Um, another thing we might ask about the novel is why must Fred Daniels die? This might be a question you could also ask your students. Why must Fred Daniels die? And I'm not even sure what I mean by must. I, wanna, I, want, I want to have that word must. I want it to be elastic. Um, by which I mean, why is it inconceivable for his antagonists to uh, let him live? Or why is it that Richard Wright as the author must end this novel as he does with Fred Daniels' death? So I, I, wanna, I wanna massage the word must. However you hear it, that's what I mean. And then finally this, um, which is it a question particular to the man who lived underground, but one inspired by the possibility that we will now be able to bring it into our classrooms? And here's the question, are you at all worried about teaching in this anti-critical race theory moment. All of us, I think, have expressed commitments to a diverse body of literatures. We want our students to see American literature in a pluralistic way. But let's not pretend that there are not forces outside of our classroom, forces at the level of the city, the county, the state, the nation, militating against these objectives of ours. Are you at all worried for teaching 
the man who lived underground specifically, but are you at all worried about teaching African-American literature broadly? to your students come fall and thereafter. <laughs>